Last week, we began a new series called Ever Wonder Why. In this series, we're asking some tough questions. These are tough questions that maybe you've asked or maybe you're asking right now. If not, no doubt, these are questions that your friends, your neighbors, and your family members are asking. Let me just say that you need to know that you're allowed to ask questions. God welcomes your questions. We don't have to be afraid to approach Him and ask. And so today, we're going to ask a tough one. Why would a good God send people to hell? It seems like this isn't a topic that's brought up much in churches. Maybe because if you want to keep people happy, you do two things, right? First of all, you don't talk about sin. and You don't talk about hell. If you want to keep people coming to your church, well, tough luck because today we're talking about both things. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a faith tradition that on occasion would make a big deal about hell. Sometimes they would even use hell as a, as a tool to scare people into a relationship with God, almost as a threat. If you don't surrender to God, you're, you're going to hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever seen uh, these evangelism tracts? This is a literature that some people would give out in order to evangelize and tell people about Jesus. But there's some tracts that would warn people about hell and would have a picture of a hand reaching out of flames, you know, and I don't know if it was the most effective way to tell people about Jesus. The question of hell is oftentimes a question that is on many people's minds. And, and much like the question that we wrestled with last week on, on suffering, it can be a deterrent on keeping people away from faith or from acknowledging the existence of God altogether. At least if God does exist, He certainly isn't very loving if He's sending people to hell. So how could a loving God send people to hell? Or how could a loving God even allow a place like hell to exist? You know, Jesus spoke about hell quite frequently, not as a means of scaring people, but usually as a warning. He had a deep desire to keep people from going there. And this is where we need to begin. God doesn't desire for you to go to hell. Jesus did everything within his power to communicate this to us. In fact, on one occasion, he, he was teaching, and he went on to say that, it, that if your eye caused you to sin, in other words, the things that you looked at, the things that you observed and that you allowed to enter into your mind, if that causes you to sin, gouge it out, because it's better to lose one part of your body than your whole body go to hell. He warned the same thing about the hand, that if your hand causes you to sin, in other words, the things that you touch, or the, things, the actions that you do, then, then cut it off because it's better for you to lose a limb than for your whole body to go to hell. What, what was Jesus saying? Was he literally telling us to saw off our hand and to poke out our eyeballs? No way, because we, we'd all be blind and we'd all give high fives with our nubs, right? What, what he was doing was warning us of the severity of a place that was created to punish evil and punish sin, and that we ought to at all costs do whatever we can do to stay out of it. So what is hell anyway? The Bible teaches that heaven is at its essence the very presence of God. In other words, to be in heaven is to be with God. Paul said that for a believer in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's a place like we spoke about last week where there is no more pain and no more tears, no more fear. It's a place where there is harmony and unity, and it's a return to God's original design. Hell, then, is the absence of the presence of God. Think of it this way. If you're a follower of Jesus, the tragedies that we see on earth, the pain that we experience, the sorrow and the anguish and the horrors that we see is the closest to hell that we'll ever get. But for those who choose to reject Jesus, those who refuse to follow God, this is the closest they'll get to heaven. Because hell is a place where God's hand is completely removed. There's no longer mercy available. There's no longer grace. His presence is not felt in hell. Simply put, hell is not a place you want to go to or experience. So then why does it exist? There's two truths that I want to help us understand today. And here's number one. Hell exists for God to righteously punish Satan. This is what the Bible teaches, that, that hell doesn't ultimately exist for people. It doesn't exist for us. It exists for Satan and his demons. 
And oftentimes when we think about Satan, we think about a guy dressed up in a, in a red costume with horns and holding a pitchfork, right? That's the way that he's depicted in cartoons, movies, and shows. Or, or we see him as this little guy that'll appear on somebody's shoulder and whisper in their ear and, and tell them the wrong things to do. But what you need to understand is that Satan is not a cartoon or a made-up character. As God and his angels exist, so does Satan and his demons. The Bible speaks about two realities. There's a, a physical reality, one that you can touch, see, feel, and taste. But there's also a spiritual reality. And Satan's job, his sole purpose for existing is to steal, kill, and destroy. In the scriptures, we learn that Satan is the very embodiment of evil. He's behind every abuse, every addiction, every fear, every ruined family, every lie, every war. In the Bible, he's known as the destroyer, the accuser, the deceiver, the tempter, the thief, and the father of lies. In fact, the Bible says that when he speaks, his native tongue is lies. You speak English or Spanish, he speaks lies. And the Bible says that hell exists for him and his demons. And you, you can read this at the end of the book, at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelations. The, the book of Revelations is the prophetic book that reveals the end times. It, it's the part of the Bible that we're currently living in and that we'll see come to fruition. There it says this, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the prophet, the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10. Our spiritual enemy has been since day one, attempting to destroy you. He's behind every source of evil in this world. And I think you'd agree. He rightly got something coming for him. Listen, I don't know if you understand. He's behind every false teaching. He's behind every cult. Those cults that have some of your family members confused and, and fooled. He's behind that. He's behind, you know, the act of a very pastor that's been disqualified from ministry because of infidelity and compromise. He's behind every line of thought that rejects and refuses to believe and to put faith in God. But guys, his time is coming to an end. His days are numbered. His reign is coming to an end. He's been on the loose like a prowling lion, the Bible says, but his days are numbered. And I think you would all agree that he deserves the worst of the worst punishment. And God's got it ready for him. Essentially, hell is a place where Satan and his demons will no longer be able to torment God's people or creation and where he himself will experience God's righteous wrath. Here's the second truth. Number two, hell exists for God to righteously punish sin. Another thing we don't like talking about uh, as a society is sin. We live in a culture that that, that wants to wink at sin or to turn the blind eye towards sin. In a society that is so individualized that we're, we're quick to allow people to think and do what they want to. After all, you do you, right? Who am I to judge? But what you need to understand is that sin is a major problem. It isn't just a little white lie. It isn't just a small blunder or a mistake. You need to understand that, that God is holy and God is just and, and that our sin is a direct offense to the perfect, holy, sinless, and righteous creator of the universe. He is our standard of holiness. He sets that mark. And you see, our culture and society is constantly changing their standards. You know, what, what was considered unspeakable or unconscionable years ago, today is celebrated, paraded, and held in regard. There's an ever-changing standard in culture, but God is the standard of holiness. The created doesn't tell the creator the rules to live by or the standard to set. No more than the painting corrects the painter on which brush to use or what color to choose. And you need to understand that our sin is not a little offense. It is a major offense. It is the slap in the face of the God of the universe. And because God is holy and righteous and perfect, he cannot allow evil and sin to go unpunished. And this isn't something we celebrate. It doesn't bring me pleasure to say it, but I have to tell you the truth. Because if you don't understand this truth, you will not be able to understand the extent of God's love, grace, and mercy. This is how wonderful God's grace and mercy is. That God would love the world so much, that he would love you so much and me so much, that he would stop and nothing to keep you not just out of hell and away from experiencing God's wrath and punishment, 
but for you to be in his presence for all eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loved you so much that he traveled the distance from heaven to earth and he endured the journey from birth to death and conquered the grave so that he could travel the distance from your head into your heart. But because God is righteous and holy and he he cannot let our evil and sin go unpunished, so he poured out his righteous wrath directed towards your sin on Jesus. And Jesus endured God's punishment for you. If you ever need a picture of how much God hates sin but loves you, look no further than Jesus' bloody, battered body on the cross. And so if you're in Christ, if you've accepted God's love and mercy made available in Jesus, your sin debt is paid. Hell is not a place for you. What waits for you is the presence of God, His forgiveness, His grace. But for those who reject God's gift of grace, those who decide to live however they want and refuse to submit to God, they've already decided their fate. What is hell? Hell is the absence of God's presence. Essentially, hell is granting those who refuse to submit to God their wish. Hell is fulfilling the desires of the hearts of those who do not want to live for God. Think about it. If you do not want to surrender to God, if you don't want to live for God, if you don't want to acknowledge God or be with God on earth, why would he force you to do it for all eternity? Well, where is God's love in that? It's in his patience. It's in his mercy. Look at what this verse says. It says, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. You need to understand God is an absolutely loving God. He doesn't want us to go to hell. And he sent Jesus to prevent it. He sent Jesus to prove the extent of his love. And he's patiently waiting. You know, some people wonder why we haven't experienced Christ's return yet. People break their heads trying to study the numbers and dates in the Bible. They've predicted wrongly time and time again the second coming of Christ. What's happening in the meantime? God is patiently waiting, not wanting that any should perish. He's waiting. He's patiently waiting for that uncle that you've been praying for. He's patiently waiting for that friend that you've shared the gospel numerous times with. He's waiting for that neighbor that you've invited to church multiple times. He's waiting for that co-worker that you gave that Bible to. He's patiently waiting. Not not that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And he's patiently waiting for you. Have you put your faith in Jesus? You simply have no idea how much he loves you. You simply have no idea the extent by which he's gone so that you don't have to pay for your own sin, so that you don't have to experience wrath, only mercy. You know, when you take eternity seriously, it changes the way that you live today because you don't just live for today. You understand that what we see and what we experience around us today is only temporary. So let's live in light of eternity. And also when you take eternity seriously, then you know what's at stake. For those that are around you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, we need to get the love of God out. We need the gospel to spread, not to scare them out of hell, but their eternity is in the balance and God is waiting. Why does God send people to hell? He doesn't send anyone to hell. Hell is for Satan and his demons to righteously experience judgment. For everyone else, Hell is a choice. And God has provided a way for us to experience eternity. He's granted us forgiveness. He's given us mercy. For those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, our sins are paid for. God's wrath and judgment was absorbed by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And that's available for you today. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see and understand how deep your love for us. Help us, God, to live in light of eternity, not just overwhelmed uh, in our present reality. 
God, help us to share with your world, with this world, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. God, we simply worship and adore you for your goodness and your patience with us, knowing, Lord, that your desire is not that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So God, I pray, Lord, in a world where we're so overwhelmed and overcome by the now, by the present, by what's going on now, help us, Lord, to live in light of eternity. Thank you, Jesus, for absorbing the wrath of God in my place. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for goodness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.